right, President McGuire. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to what promises to be just an amazing evening with Dr. Cornell West. Uh, Dr. West, we are so pleased to welcome you to our Trinity community. Um, we wish you could be here in person, but we are glad to have you virtually. And thank you for taking time mm -hmm. out of what we know is quite a schedule to be with us. I, I just want to note um, two things. One, um, I first became familiar with your work, Dr. West, in the middle of the 1990s. Um, when Trinity was going through the great transition from being a predominantly white institution to a predominantly black institution. And there were one or two controversies around that, as you might guess. Um, and you published a book at that time called Race Matters, which I devoured. Um, and your philosophy and thinking was very helpful to me as I thought about how to manage Trinity through the great transformation that occurred here. So I wanna thank you for that. I feel that I learned so much from your writing at that time. Um, I followed you intensely since then. Uh, you are truly one of the great intellectuals in American life today, and you are unafraid to challenge every single thing that needs to be challenged, um, both within the academy and outside of it. Um, and you're fighting uh, for uh, racial justice and challenging white supremacy is near and dear to all of our hearts here at Trinity. Uh, so we look forward this evening to hearing from you. I want to take this moment also to thank Dr. Jamal Watson, who has uh, been just a wonderful part of our team at Trinity, bringing Dr. West here tonight, uh, brought Yamish Alcindor a few weeks ago, had Reverend Al Sharpton uh, last year, and many more. So thank you, Dr. Watson, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you both. Good evening, and thank you so much, President McGuire, for your vision and your leadership. I hope you all are excited about this evening as I am. I want to certainly ask you if you have a question to be able to put your question in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many of those um, before the evening is over. I first met Dr. Cornell West during my undergraduate years at Georgetown University. His seminal text, Grace Matters, had been published in 1993, and Father Leo O'Donovan, who was president of Georgetown at the time, asked me if I wanted to meet Dr. West at the airport and bring him to campus, where he was scheduled to speak at the historic Gaston Hall. Doc, I don't know if you remember that day. <laughs> But I was so excited because I had read Race Matters and I had read all of his earlier works and it was like I had died and gone to heaven. It was wonderful. But from the moment that we first met, uh, Dr. West was not only gracious with his time, but he invited me that evening to join him at dinner. And we talked for several hours about everything from Socrates to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I will never forget that interaction. It is the kind of critical engagement that I try to emulate and model as a professor who is looking to inspire the next generation of scholars and thinkers. That connection began in almost 30 years, it's hard to believe it's been that long, uh -huh. relationship with the nation's most prolific thinker and activist. Dr. West is not only a brilliant philosopher, but he is genuinely committed to the plight of the downtrodden, or as Jesus would say, the least of these. And when I come calling, as I often do, he is always <laughs> and generous with his time. Dr. West's accomplishments are far too many to mention here, and I won't do that. He's written over 20 books, had professorships at some of the most prestigious institutions in the world, and he has been on the front line to dismantle racism and corporate greed and has forced all of us to lift up the plight of the trans community and to challenge the viciousness of homophobia. As he once eloquently said, you can't lead the people if you don't love the people. And he reminds us every day that, quote, if the kingdom of God is within us, then everywhere we go, we should leave a little bit of heaven behind. Please join me in welcoming my friend, my dear brother, a wonderful mentor to so many of us in the field, Dr. Cornell West. My dear brother, my dear brother, thank you for those loving, kind, and generous words. You know it's always a blessing for me to both be in conversation with you, to get a chance to see you, and just soak in the your soul, though, brother. You got a sharpness of mind that goes with a goldenness of heart that is a rare thing, and it's a beautiful thing. And Trinity is so very blessed 
to have you. And of course, we both want to salute our dear sister, Sister President Patricia McGuire. I mean, when you think the average uh, a term of a college president usually is about five to seven, maybe nine years, but when you have 33 high quality years of loving service to an institution, she arrived in 1970 as a freshman and 51 years later, she still got a smile on her face. She still got fire in her soul. And she's got that genuine commitment to not just Trinity, but also the kingdom, the beloved community as it breaks in in our broken world, our nightmarish world. I want to salute all of the faculty and the staff and the students at Trinity building on the rich legacy, going back to our precious vanilla um, predominant uh, uh, sisters in the Catholic tradition, the Catholic sisters who couldn't get into Catholic university and being willing to bear witness and then provide the basis for what then became a predominantly chocolate institution. And that's a very, very rich cultural cross-fertilization, a, a mixture, because when you think of prophetic Catholicism in America, one of my favorite freedom fighters of all time was a vanilla sister named Dorothy Day. Nobody like her. You remember the, the eulogy she wrote for Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. learned how to die daily. Front page, Catholic worker, April 5th, 1968. Learning how to die daily. Critically examining who we are, calling into question certain assumptions. Anytime you let certain assumptions go, that's a form of death so that you learn how to die in order to learn how to live. Of course, Paul talks about this in the Christian New Testament. Christians must die daily to come to terms with that which is inside of us that needs to be pushed back. The greed, the hatred, the envy, the resentment, the hypocrisy, and it's inside of all of us. And so I think of Dorothy Day, I think of Phil Barrigan as a whole wave of great Catholic brothers and sisters who have made such a major contribution, not just to America, but to the world. So I want to begin first by just acknowledging uh, the ways in which all of us at this present moment need to examine ourselves in terms of our mission and vocation, in terms of our callings, in terms of that which we feel as if at the very depths of our being, we're here to be and do in that short trek between mama's womb and tomb. And so I have to begin on a Socratic note. The unexamined life is not worth living. When I think about my own life, the first thing that comes to my mind is I am who I am because somebody loved me. Somebody cared for me. Somebody attended to me. And this is what subversive piety is. You see, piety is not critical, uncritical deference to dogma. It's not blind obedience to doctrine. Piety is, and Augustine understood this at his best, Aquinas picks up on it. it goes all the way through the Christian tradition on through secular conceptions of piety that you get in John Dewey and George Sadayana. Piety is the virtuous acknowledgement of the sources of good in our lives. So if you're religious, yes, you begin with God, but if you're secular, you can begin with mama and daddy. You begin with friends. You can begin with intellectual ancestors. Maybe James Baldwin keeps you going. You can begin with artists. Maybe Erica Badu keeps you going. 
everybody needs to have sources in their lives that help sustain them and push them toward moral and spiritual excellence, what the Greeks would call arate, moral and spiritual excellence, integrity, honesty, decency, generosity. And so for me, I begin with Irene West, Clifton West, that I'll never ever be half of the human being that they were, mom and dad. My highest honor in the world is being the second son of Irene Clifton West. And that's inseparable from Shiloh Baptist Church on the chocolate side of Sacramento, California. I think the Reverend Willie P. Cook and Deacon Hinton and Sarah Ray, my vacation Bible school teacher. They used to tell me over and over, Cornell, it's all about trying to see Jesus more clearly, follow Jesus more nearly, love Jesus more dearly. Now, you may not be a Christian, but you got to learn how to see things more deeply and clearly. The great Henry James once wrote a letter to Robert Louis Stevenson, January 12th, 1901, where he says, no theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. No theory, no philosophy, no theology is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. If you can't see the dignity, see the sanctity, see the imago Dei, the image of God in other human beings, then something is getting in the way, is cheating you. If you can't see what people are up against, structures and institutions, vicious legacies of white supremacy, ugly legacies of male supremacy, homophobia and transphobia, we can't see empires shaping the world in their image, going back to Rome during the time of Jesus up to the present American empire with its AFRICOM sites all across the continent with 800 military units all around the world with very military presence shaping the world in its own image and interest. If we can't see the wealth inequality, we can't see the poverty, we can't see the inadequate housing and dilapidated school systems, decrepit ways of life that lose sight of the rich humanity and sanctity and dignity of people. So, so, so much of, of, of trying to keep track of moral and spiritual excellence has to do with what we see, what are the lens through which we see. To be fundamentally committed to care and nurturing, whatever form it takes, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, teachers, poets, plumbers, professors, whatever form that witness takes, we have to be clear in our seeing. And that's what was always accented for me, thank God, at Shiloh Baptist Church. Now the Black Panther Party was right next door. And I learned much from the Black Panther Party. I'd never joined because they were deeply secular and agnostic and I loved them and they loved me, but I'm a Jesus loving free black man. So therefore I couldn't become fundamentally a part. So I worked in the breakfast program. I worked in the prison program when I got to college at Cambridge and worked very close with the Black Panther Party. And they became part of the, my lens. So when, when I looked at the world, I always looked at the world through the lens of those, the great Franz Fanon called the wretched of the earth. And I was just blessed to write the new introduction for the 60th anniversary of Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth just appeared just a, just a few weeks ago. So I've been very blessed in that regard to remain a part of that rich legacy. What does it mean to look at the world through the lens of the wretched of the earth? What does it mean to look at the world through the lens of the least of these echoes of the 25th chapter of Matthew? What does it mean to look at the world through the lens of the cross? And the cross is not simply a Christian symbol but it signifies unarmed truth. And the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. It signifies 
unapologetic love. So you can be a Buddhist like Bell Hooks and be full of love. You can be an agnostic like James Ball and be full of love. You can be Hindu like Mahatma Gandhi and be full of love. And all of us fall short in our various ways, but this love is still for me at the very center of it. And when I think of these pillars, the West family, indescribable love, Shiloh Baptist Church, deep love rooted at the foot of the cross, and then the Black Panther Party and their revolutionary legacy of calling for fundamental social change when it comes to the prison system, the mass incarceration regime, when it comes to Wall Street, Silicon Valley, with too much greed runs the muck and not enough resources available. There's those, those Sly Stone call every everyday people, those James Cleveland call ordinary people, keeping track of any form of domination, no matter who it is, because each human being, no matter what color, no matter what class, no matter what gender or sexual orientation, has a preciousness and a pricelessness which we must forever see. And to see more clearly means then that you want to feel more deeply so that you're able to love and have compassion for those who suffer. And when you feel more deeply, then you want to act more courageously. And courage is always the enabling virtue of all the other virtues, be it faith, hope, love, justice, whatever virtue you have. Without courage is empty, is vacuous, is sounding brass and tinkling cymbal, as Paul says in the 13th chapter, 1 Corinthians. Now, I am from a great people with a grand tradition. And I'm talking about Black people. See, there's no other people in the modern world who have been hated so chronically and systemically and yet keep dishing out love warriors, teach the world so much about love what love is, what love can do. That's what John Coltrane's Love Supreme is all about. That's what Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. Got love shot through every note, every silence between the notes. Stevie Wonder's Love and the Need of Love. These are love warriors. Ashford Simpson. Every song shot through a genuine Love as the real thing. We're not talking about no semblance. We're not talking about no imitation. We're talking about the real thing. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X. What did James Baldwin say about Malcolm X? He had a love of beginning with Black folk and spilled over in the latter years of his life to everybody, especially, especially oppressed people. Fannie Lou Hamer. She had so much love oozing out of her brilliant mind and loving heart. There was never enough time, never enough space to express it. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. What is the light? The light is the love. What is letting shine? Manifest in the deeds. Manifest in the service to others. There's never been a people in the modern world who have been so thoroughly terrorized psychically, spiritually, economically, politically, and yet keep dishing out freedom fighters. That's Harriet Tubman. That's Frederick Douglass. You terrorize us. We're not going to create a black version of the Ku Klux Klan to terrorize you back. We want freedom for everybody. Moral and spiritual excellence in the face of barbarism. That's what vicious white supremacist slavery was. That's what vicious white supremacist neo-slavery called Jim Crow and Jane Crow was. That's what we're still dealing with in terms of its legacy. And yet with these love warriors and these 
freedom fighters. Here come Ella Baker. We can go on and on. My God, what a people. Not because of just skin pigmentation. No, no, no. Mm -mm. We got black gangsters. We got black thugs. No, no. It's, it's a black people who decide to undergo ethical cultivation, spiritual formation, profound education to see more clearly, to feel more lovingly and deeply, and to act more courageously. And, I, and when I talk about gangsters and thugs, I'm not just calling names because uh, I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and now I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. So I'm talking about the gangster in me, as Tupac would say, the thug in me that's battling all the time with the best in me, the, the proclivity, the tilt toward love, deep faith, hope, and service to others. That's a civil war taking place on the soul of every human being, no matter who they are. And that's precisely why Trinity is so very important because it provides a space, a site, a context in which you don't just undergo schooling, which is shaping of skills, but you undergo deep education, which is how you're going to use those skills in order to be of service to others. And that constitutes the leaven in the American loaf. And what does the leaven do? It expands the loaf. It keeps, keeps the bread of life fresh enough that you have a civic life, that you have a citizenship, not just greed and hatred and hypocrisy, those hounds of hell in the words of the great Howard Thurman, who of course was a teacher of Martin Luther King Jr. Those hounds of hell, the hatred, the greed, the envy, the resentment, the hypocrisy. You push it back, try to kill it in order to learn how to live more lovingly, courageously, critically. And so whatever our calling is, it is never reducible just to our careers. No, not at all. Whatever our vocation is, it's never reducible to just our profession. No, when you look at my dear brother, Professor Jamal Watson, his scholarship, his magnificent essays and writings, the issues of diversity and a variety of other journals, academic and otherwise. When you look at our dear sister, President Patricia McGuire, they're here because they're called to be here. They're not here simply for success no no they want to be great and somewhere i read he or she is greatest among you will be your servant in terms of willingness to have a hypersensitivity to those who suffer cast a light on those who are hurt and pained and then try to raise their voices so that the world can be changed and a better place and yes i do come from a great black people whose anthem is lift every voice, is not lift every echo. And I tell my young brothers and sisters this all the time, because I spend a lot of time in studio with them. And there's some wonderful young folks, the Cornell West Theory in DC and uh, J. Cole, I mean, some beautiful Kendrick Lamar and so forth, but I'm old school. And I tell them when I enter, I said, I'm looking for voices. I'm looking for originals. Aretha was original. Luther Vandross was original. Donnie Hathaway, original. Then you got geniuses. Curtis Mayfield, yes. Original Sam Cooke, yes. Nina Simone, yes. And we ain't even got to the top with Sarah Vaughn. And Billy Holiday, and Ella Fitzgerald. And Dinah Washington and Carmen McRae. What was it about? They found their voice. They were not imitations. That's what Theolonius Monk told the great John Coltrane, don't imitate Johnny Hodges of the Duke Ellington band. 
find your voice train. Come to my house. I'll play some music for you. Train said, hmm, sometimes that sounds wrong. Monk said, sometimes wrong is right. I'm not going to sound like James P. Johnson and William the Lion Smith. I'm not going to sound like the great Earl Gardner or Earl Father Hines. I'm going to sound like Theolonius Monk around midnight. Oh, Lord, have mercy. James Brown was the same way. George Clinton and Bootsy the same way. We gonna be original, but every voice, every voice emerges by listening closely to the voices of others. They asked Miles Davis, what is jazz? Jazz is four words, he said, Louis Armstrong and Charlie Parker. And what he meant by that was, anytime you talk about some abstract, like jazz, you got to get concrete to talk about the individual voices, the individual geniuses, the individual figures. He could have said Mary Lou Williams or Jerry Allen. He could have said Alice Coltrane on the piano. He could have said a whole host of other examples. But it's the examples that make the difference. That's the crucial thing. And we cannot talk about race, class, gender, empire, any form of ideology, any institutional practice that, lead, that, 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 that misses out on the humanity of people without our mustering the courage to think critically, raise our voices, and then to organize and mobilize and bring power and pressure to bear on status quo is in place. And this is a major challenge. And we live in a time in which you see, uh, you know, the 10 commandments are pushed aside and everybody's obsessed with the 11th commandment, thou shall not get caught. And so you got not just the polarization of our society, you get the gangsterization of our society. And the difference between Polarization and gangsterization is that uh, polarization, you still have hypocrites, and hypocrites have a sense of what the standards are. They just know they're falling short. Hypocrisy is the tribute that vice plays the virtue. But when you're a gangster, you have no standards. You don't care about what the standards are. You say anything and think you can get away with it. You do anything and think you can get away with it. It's just a matter of thou shalt not get caught. And Trump is just a symbol and a symptom of that. Because he's a neo fascist gangster. Dead up, you see. He still made an image of God. You see, I'm a Christian, so I believe Jesus died for everybody. And Jesus loves everybody, but he chooses to be a gangster. But he's just a symbol. This sense of gangsterization is taking place in every site, every sphere in our society, no matter what color they are, because everybody's up for sale and everything is up for sale. It's money, 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 money commodification all the way down, commercialization all the way down, marketization all the way down. Young folk come up to me these days, Brother West, Brother West, what's your brand? I ain't got no brand. I got a cause. No, everybody got a brand. No, no, no. My people were branded when they got off those slave ships. That was a commodification. That was the economic exploitation. Then the white supremacist lies about their minds and their beauty and their hearts and souls. So that white supremacy and the predatory capitalist project get intertwined and then you steal the land from indigenous people so you get imperial expansion too. No, I don't have a brand. I got a cause. And what is a cause? Back to what we talked about with Brother Jamal and Sister Patricia. The cause is your calling. Your cause is your vocation. What are you here to do to be? a force for truth and beauty and goodness. And for me as a Christian, the holy, but I know we got some folk who are secular. We love you too, we love you too. You just got a different sense of, of what you can have sacred values rather than the holy God. I got both, I got both. Let me, let me bring this to a close because I wanna make sure we have good time for, for call and response and dialogue here. But I think more than anything else these days, we have to resist all forms of fakery and phoniness. 
And this is especially true among the middle classes who are so obsessed with success. If success becomes idolatry if it's not used for something bigger than itself. See, grandmama and granddad in many ways understood this much better than some of our black middle-class folk or the black bourgeoisie who becomes drunk with the wine of the world. That's the language of the Negro national anthem. Drunk with the wine of the world, obsessed with the felicities of bourgeois existence. Look at me, look at me. I'm so smart, I'm so rich. They end up being a peacock, peacock strut because they can't fly. I come from a people who like to fly, like Tony Morrison's Song of Solomon, Ralph Ellison's Flying Home. I've taught in prison for 44 years, and the anthem of many of the brothers in prison comes from a genius from Tuskegee named Lionel Richie and the Commodores called Zoom. I want to fly away, well, I like to fly away, well, I like to fly away, Zoom, Zoom, baby. That's a freedom dream. It's a freedom dream. And for we Christians, it has to do with the kingdom. It has to do with authorizing another world. And that world is inbreaking in this world. And it's manifest with love and a hope and a faith and a keep keeping on in the language of Curtis Mayfield. That's what Trinity has been about at its best. That's why he's blessed to have my dear brother Jamal because he's part and parcel of this grand, beloved community inbreaking on a world that is drunk with greed and hatred and hypocrisy. And as we bear witness in the world, but not up, over against the world, not conforming, not being complicit and cowardly, but rather cutting against the grain and remembering what the great Mary Ellen Pleasant, who was a black sister, gave John Brown $600,000 in 1855. She married a white robber baron. He dropped dead. She got his money and used his money to support the black freedom movement. She had centers for alcoholics and addicts all across California. She's known as the godmother of California. She used to begin every speech, I'd rather be a corpse than a coward. That's Mary Ellen Pleasant. She ought to be a household name. And Brother Martin Luther King Jr. used to say, I'd rather be dead than afraid. Most important sentence in James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time in that wonderful letter to his nephew, his brother Wilbur's son, he says, you, comma, don't be afraid. In front of every rally, Marcus Garvey always had one black person holding a sign, the Negro is not afraid. And once you look fear in the face and work through it, wrestle with it and say, I'm a free man. Nobody's gonna intimidate me. Nobody's gonna make me so scared that I can't raise my voice, that I can't feel and love anybody without anybody's permission. Nobody's gonna tell me. I can't bear witness to what I feel inside of my soul. That's what Walter Hawkins has in mind when he says, what is this that I feel so deep inside? What is this fire, whatever it is? I know it. I can't hold my peace. That's a great people. We need to keep that tradition alive. That represents for me the best of the tradition as well, at my beloved Trinity. Let me stop there, brother, and open it up to me. Thank you so much, Dr. West. You really have blessed us, I think, to, tonight, and we certainly want to get to as many questions as we can. Um, but I do want to start off with a question, and this actual question actually came from one of my graduate students. When I told him uh, you were coming, he was so excited because he had read all of your work and was looking forward to hearing from you, but he said, Dr. Watson, can you please ask Dr. West why he was so hard on President Obama? <laughs> so I promised him that I would ask that question. I appreciate that question. <laughs> that question. No, no, indeed, indeed. You know my dear brother Sharpton, who I love, 
and take a bullet for. We used to fight over this tooth and nail because as brothers and comrades, we have disagreements and we agree to disagree because he was working on the inside, very close to Brother Barack and uh, 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 raising crucial issues in terms of, uh, as it related to civil rights and voting rights and so forth. Whereas I decided to be very, very critical because I worked very closely with Brother Barack Obama. I, worked, I did 65 events for him in 2008 when he first called me up because uh, he had first given his speech in Boston. You know, he said, well, uh, America's a magical place. I said, this brother's going to have a Christopher Columbus experience. He's going to discover America. Ain't nothing magical about America. Uh, America is what it is at its best because people fight for it, blood, sweat, and tears. And every generation has to fight that battle. That's not magic. That's blood, sweat, and tears. So when he called me, he said, why did you say that on TV? I said, I said it because I believed it. I, I say what I mean to be what I say. I'm not posing the boss. But I decided to be a critical of, supportive, supporter of him. And I did from, uh, uh, from the very beginning in, in Iowa and ended the night before the election. But I had told him, I said, when you win, I'm going to break dance like MC Hammer in the afternoon. But I'll emerge as your major critic because I'm critical of the system, not just critical of individuals. And so when he sided with Wall Street and bailed out Wall Street and didn't bail out the homeowners, I had to come down on moral and spiritual grounds. Black middle class lost 58% of his wealth. They were still crazy about him, but Wall Street was breakdancing to the, to the bank, with trillions of dollars. Trillions. And not one Wall Street person went to jail. I couldn't take that. When he met with the Wall Street folk, what did he say? Well, they didn't, they didn't talk about it too much in the Times, but people knew he had the meeting with the top 13 firms and he told them, I stand between you and the pitchforks, but don't worry, I will protect you. You see, I, that's what you say to poor people. That's what you say to black people. That's what you say to working people. You don't say that to Wall Street. See, my Jesus ran out the money changes. Not because he hated them, because they were too greedy. And Wall Street was too greedy. And when they, when they commit crimes inside of trading, market manipulation, fraudulent activity, predatory lending, you send them to jail after a fair trial. Not one Wall Street executive went to jail. But when my brother and sister on the block gets caught with crack, they go straight to jail. I can't take that. That's wrong. So I went at him on that. Same was true with drones. See, George Bush, 45 drones, killing innocent folk in Somalia, Libya, Pakistan. I said, a drone that kills an innocent person is a crime against humanity. I don't care who they are. I don't care who they are. Brother Obama, 563 drones, killing thousands of innocent civilians. That's wrong, no matter what color he is. So that once, once you side with the rich with Wall Street and have militarism abroad, and Martin Luther King Jr. was always talking about poverty, militarism, racism, and materialism, then I had to come down hard on Barack Obama because he began to act as if he was just a neoliberal Democrat who gives nice speeches. But when it comes to fighting for poor people, hardly a word. Teaching in prisons, the brothers would ask me every week, when is he going to say something about the new Jim Crow? When is he going to say something about mass incarceration regime? He finally gave a speech after seven years. Seven years it took him to give a speech. He had one legislation about crack cocaine, which was fine, put pressure on him. Wonderful. But he didn't want to touch the issue because he thought it might alienate the white mainstream, I don't give a god dang about no white mainstream when it comes to morality and spirituality. We gotta bear witness. We gotta push them. We don't adjust to them. There's a difference between being a thermostat and a thermometer. And when I first talked to him, I told him, brother, you got to be a thermostat. And the thermostat always shapes the climate of opinion. Thermometer just reflects it. Most politicians are thermometers. They just check and see what the, the climate is, and they're just in order to, to win the next election. I said, no, we come from a great people who have been thermostats. Adam Clayton Powell Jr. in Congress, he was a thermostat. Harold Washington at the local level, he was a thermostat. Ron Dellums coming out of Oakland, he was a thermostat. We shape the opinion. And if you're not going to shape the opinion, you're just going to reflect Wall Street interests, corporate interests then you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, given the suffering of the people. So that was what the battle was about. 
And our brother Sharp, it was kind of saying, oh, brother West, I'm, 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 I'm prophetic like you. I'm just Nathan and you much more Jeremiah. I said, well, no, no, I'm too big of a gangster to be Jeremiah. But at the same time, I'm, I'm gonna speak my truth. Nathan was on the inside, but Nathan still put hard pressure on David in the biblical story, you see. So Sharpton and I had this inside outside dialogue, but we would still meet, you know, in the streets when it came to Michael Brown and when it came to uh, um, George Floyd, Jr. and so many of the other black folk suffering. But that's the beginning of a question, but I appreciate that question from. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, a, it's an interesting question because I think, again, um, some people may see this as a personal thing, and it was never really personal for oh, you. No, this was no. really about policy, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, with, with Brother Sharpton, you know, when, when when Sister Elizabeth died, you know, Brother Dwight McKee, who we both love and take a bullet for when she died, we were in the pulpit together. I mean, he's a bona fide preacher, and I'm just a layperson, but we're in the pulpit together because we come out of the same tradition. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And also, also Thanks. I think that sometimes when, when, when Black people criticize each other, it's seen as conflict, uh, when, when, when uh, rather that we don't often see that when there's disagreement in, in other communities as well. So I think that's, that's exactly. important. And here we again, we learn from our musicians. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We learn from our, I mean, Curtis Mayfield's falsetto is not the same as, as Eddie Kendrick's falsetto. Yeah, yeah. No, not at all. Dinah Washington is different than... Uh, uh, than, than, than Dakota State. And, I mean, all of us have our own different voices. Yeah. Gladys Knight don't have to sound like Aretha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question, you identify as a democratic socialist. Uh, what does that mean um, to you uh, to, 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 to identify in that tradition? Well, it means that you have to have some accountability at the very top of the economy so you don't have the greedy few who have so much and the needy many who have so little. It means there has to be democratic institutions of accountability so that workers, the great, the great social uh, uh, ethics of the Catholic church that focuses on labor and make it says, no, there's a dignity in labor and workers must have their voices heard at the workplace. You see, now that's, that's a, a democratizing of the workplace kind of thing Rick Wolf and the others talk about. Yeah. So that democratic socialism is simply the notion of allowing social, allowing democracy to spill over, not just in voting at, for politicians, but also workers having their voices heard at the workplace as to where the money's going, yeah. who gains access to the profits. So that's a critique of capitalism. And when you think about the Black folk who have been democratic, so Martin Luther King Jr., democratic socialist, see? Du Bois in the early 1900s was democratic socialist. Uh, um, oh my God, uh, Ella Baker. I mean, there's just so many towering figures who will call for the democratizing of the workplace along with the democratizing of the ballot. And, and just for black folks, just to gain the right to vote was a major bloody struggle, you know what I mean? So yeah. I can understand people saying, well, you know, you got the right, well, no, we want to be able to choose what goes on at the workplace so that our politicians won't get bought off by the corporate elites. So we end up voting for folks who are already selected by the corporate elite. Yeah. And our politicians end up too spineless. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have a question here from Victoria. What is your view on critical race uh, theory being taken out of the schools uh, or the debate really around uh, CRT? You know, the, the great W.B. Du Bois wrote a classic in 1920 called The Souls of White Folk. Most people know about the souls of Black folk in 1903. But I would hope that all of the precious students at Trinity would read The Souls of White Folk. What Du Bois says, you know, America has a fear of the truth and it believes that the efficacy of lies can sustain its social experiment. But no lie lives forever. And truth crushed the earth shall rise again. And the attempt to push not just critical race theory, but any critical thinking about white supremacy, to push it out is simply to have a fear of the truth. Let's just have a serious conversation about race and white supremacy. Let's see what the world looks like through black eyes. What does America look like from the vantage point of the plantation? 
What does America look like from the vantage point of, of sharecroppery during Jim Crow? What does America look like from the vantage point of the hood and mass incarceration? You see, that's all we're saying. You see, a fear of the truth. How come you fear the truth so? Because you think the lie is benefiting you. And we say those lies are hiding crimes against us in the name of the law. That's what slavery was. It was legal, right? But a crime against humanity. Jim and Jane Crow, legal. Supreme Court authorized it. Crime against humanity. And we know that's true, not just in, in this country, but it's been true for Dalits in India. It's been true for Roma in Europe. It's been true for Black South Africans under American apartheid. It's been true for peasants Brazil, I mean, all of these laws that are tilted against the vulnerable and the politically weak. So critical race theory is simply saying, let's collectively engage in a quest for truth. Let's tell the truth about America. The truth about America doesn't mean that all white folks somehow are, are, are devils. No, no, you got John Brown, you got Dorothy Day, you got Phil Barrigan, you got you got Patricia McGuire, you got a whole host of vanilla folk who cutting against white supremacy because they choose to be involved in a quest for truth and moral and spiritual excellence. That's a choice, you see. Uh, but it's hard to, uh, to deal with the uh, people who have a profound fear of the truth. And so these legislatures, especially, you know, are using, I mean, I can, uh, it's very interesting you mentioned, and I got this right here, I, you know, I live, in Harlem here. Here it is right here, critical race there. And I was blessed to write the uh, the foreword back in 1992. Mm -hmm. And Kimberly let's, Crenshaw. Say, let's look through the lens of black folk, our doings and our sufferings, and let's talk about the truths of America. I don't think any one view has the full truth. You know, as a Christian, I know that we all are fallen and fallible. So I don't believe one particular viewpoint has the full truth. Yeah. But there's a whole lot of truths yeah. that critical race theory is going to lay bare. People don't want to hear it. They don't want to come to terms with it. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And our friend Kimberly Crenshaw, of course, and the work that she's yeah. done yeah. is so important in, in this regard. Um, yeah, she's one of the co-editors just with old brother, brother Kendall, yeah, Kendall absolutely. Thomas, yeah. Neil Katanda, and Garrett Pella. They, 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 and that's what, 20? No, that's almost 30 years, man. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You, wow. Of course, the lesson to still be here, though, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. That's right. When we met almost 30 years ago, yeah, you're absolutely. still looking strong, and I'm going to put along. But... <laughs> absolutely. Question from uh, uh, Candace Thomas. It says, Dr. West, when did you discover your purpose, and was it due to a life event? No, no, I was just shaping the bosom of Irene and Clifton and Shiloh Baptist and the Black Panther Party and intellectuals like Sinclair Drake and Martin Kilson and Preston Williams and, uh, and, and other folk who loved me. It was, it was not really an event. It's true that the, uh, the vicious murder of Brother Martin Luther King Jr. I was 14 years old and I was running track. We're gonna be a great athlete and track star. My brother was one of the greatest athletes in track and field of the 20th century. So I was deeply influenced by him, Clifton West. But when they shot Martin, something died in me, even at 14. Mm -hmm. I'd heard him speak just a few years before. And I said to myself, well, if the Lord could use me so to build on his legacy, and that's what's so beautiful about it, because you see, even this text here, you see this text, the radical king mm -hmm. that I put together, edited by myself. You see how good God is to be able to be a part of this rich legacy. It humbles you to be a part of this rich legacy. You know what I mean? That's like a, being a singer and building on Al Green and Phyllis Hyman. I mean, you're humbled by the level of excellence, but what they did and what they were able to pull off, which is to empty themselves and be of sonic service, service in the form of sound, to empower us. Mm -hmm. And that's why the musicians are the models. For me. I'm a jazz man in the life of the mind. 
Mm. The musicians are the model. They're the ones at the highest level who give up themselves and empower and enable others to take it to the height. Yeah. And thinkers and intellectuals and politicians, if you can't learn from Duke Ellington and Count Basie what spiritual royalty is, you need to check yourself. Yeah, I remember hearing you talk about James Brown and how when James Brown performed, he gave everything, literally yeah. everything. Yeah, everything. He could barely walk. At the end of every performance, I'm an extension of you. You're an extension of me. Brother Sharpton would know he's, he's his adopted son. He mm -hmm. said, I don't exist without you. Did anybody come here to hear a song we didn't play? We've been playing for three and a half hours. You didn't play Soul Power. Hit it, Bootsy. Play the song right there on the spot. It came mm. to serve. Mm. Yeah. It came to serve. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. Question, what does America look like with the return of Trump in 2024? And please speak on the January 6th insurrection. Well, I mean, as I said before, Trump's a neo-fascist gangster. And the fact that people are so down and out and they feel as if the system is so broken and they feel as if the only way out is to follow uh, neo-fascist gangsterism. It may not be just Trump, it may be another version of neo-fascist gangsterism of other Republicans moving in that direction. And neo-fascism is the public face of white supremacy. No doubt about that. In the background, the rule of big military, big money, Wall Street. And so people don't see what's behind that public face, you see. That Trump was already tied into preserving military expansion. That's why the military budget shot up. He was already tied into tax cuts for the rich and the corporate elites. You see, that's why you didn't hear a whole lot of critiques from them. Some of them, but not too many, because they were doing so well before the pandemic hit. So if in 2024, if we got to deal with neo-fascist gangsterism again. You know, American democracy could be over mm. because they don't want to even acknowledge elections anymore. They think power makes morality and might makes right. Uh, it, it, it's, it's what I'm calling the gangsterization intensifying and escalating. But keep in mind, I mean, for black folk, you know, we've been gangsterized by white supremacists for 400 years in terms of uh, 244 years of slavery, another 100 years of neo-slavery. It's just in the last 40 or 50 years, we've had an attempt to create a multiracial democracy. So gangsterization coming at us is not new, Yeah, not at all. Yeah, yeah. Here's a question from our, our provost, uh, Provost Carlota Ocampo. She says, I was wondering if Dr. West still has a connection to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and how he situates the resurging truth of Tulsa's history within the American racial reckoning. Mm -hmm. Appreciate my dear sister. Salute the work that she's doing as provost as part of the team, the visionary courageous leadership at Trinity. Uh, but yes, I was born in Tulsa. I was born in Moton Hospital, same hospital as the Wilson brothers of the Gap Band. Mm -hmm. And that Gap, G-A-P stands for Greenwood, Archer and Pine. That was the Black Wall Street. So the Gap Band making a political statement just by naming themselves. And uh, uh, my grandfather's pastor of um, Metropolitan Baptist Church on the chocolate side, Northeast Tulsa. My father grew up there. Uh, I grew up in California, but we would go back every summer to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And that 1921 massacre of precious black people uh, is resurfacing now. And that's a beautiful thing. That's just part of the truth of, of, of the history of, of America, the history of Oklahoma, the history of Tulsa. Uh, and we need to come to terms uh, with it. And I think it's a very good thing that these truths surface very much so. But, but I love Tulsa. I love Tulsa. You know, that, that's granddad, grandma, and uncle Earl, ain't tiny, you know, all my cousins and things. Most of them, you know, are dead now, but I'll never, ever, ever forget them. Yeah. We've got room for a couple more questions. I want to Absolutely. Get no, we go as long as you want it, bro. Yeah. Dr. West, what books would you recommend for someone just getting into activism? Just getting that, I would read uh, Robin D.G. Kelly's book, Freedom Dreams. 
Would, would, would you agree with that, brother? Yeah, that absolutely. Time? Absolutely. Who's out at uh, UCLA, right? Is UCLA. Absolutely. Yeah. I would read James Baldwin's The Fire next time. We talked about that before. Letter to the mess whose nephew and then down at the cross. A letter from a region of my mind. That's still of the classic. I would read a Toni Morrison's book of the sources of self-regard, her nonfiction. The novels, of course, you want to read, but the nonfiction. I wish I had a copy of that here. So, oh, here, yeah, here it is, here. Here's our dear sister right here. Mm. Toni Morrison, The Sources of Self-Regard. This is a classic. Wow. She is our greatest writer. She's the Sarah Vaughan of, uh, of, of, of American literature, which is the highest level of artistry. Uh, uh, and so I, those three would, I would start with. Yeah. Absolutely. A question, if corporations have so much influence on both major parties, what is the utility of voting? That comes from Tim Williams. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, there's still some change that could come places, that, come, that could take place. It would be very small and incremental, but it can make some difference. I mean, the difference between Biden and Trump was still significant enough to vote for Biden. And I've got strong critiques of Biden strong critiques in terms of him being one of the architects of mass incarceration. I think mass incarceration is a crime against humanity. Uh, same is true with the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Hundreds and thousands of precious Iraqis killed. Biden voted for that, he pushed for that. So I'm very critical of him, but him being in office is still one that makes some difference. Different than Trump being in office. So that even given the, the corporate domination of American politics, even the difference between a neo-fascist and a neoliberal is still important enough to vote. The problem is that both are tied to big military, big money Wall Street, corporate elites, you see, and don't want to hit poverty head on and support militarism abroad yeah <clears throat> let's get a question from our uh dean dean uh bridget newton uh how can you help our students search support and find their calling how can they continue the work that you do well i mean i appreciate the question again from uh, one of the leaders here at this grand institution but i i, I think each and every student you know has to examine the dark corners of their own soul and decide for themselves what they're here on earth for. And you can have consultation, consultation with you know, your, your mother and your father and your teachers and others, but in the end, you have to choose. It's just like when you fall in love, you don't ask for people's permission as to who you love. You can ask for some consultation <laughs> to give you some advice and counsel, but in the end, you got to choose. You got to choose. So it is when it comes to mission vocation, purpose. So you put them in a context where they can seek and search for their purpose, search for their mission. But in the end, they got to choose. Yeah. yeah. In the end, they have to choose. Mm -hmm. Just tell them you're going to be there and support them, you know, get, give them the choice that they make. Yeah. Last question here, uh, and that is, uh, from our president, President McGuire. She says, Dr. West, academic freedom, which you know a little something about, uh, in American higher education is also in danger. Can That's you right. comment on how the freedom of faculty and students to speak out is important to protect, to preserve our way of life? No, I appreciate the question, my dear sister president, because when I say lift every voice, I mean it. Lift every voice doesn't mean the voices have to conform to my voice. There always be a variety of different voices. Some will be conservative, some will be centrist, some will be liberal, some will be radical across the board. See, people do have a right to be wrong in a conversation because there's gonna be conversations where we're wrong and our voices must be heard, must be protected. But every voice has to be responsible. So you try to respect other voices. And you have to take the accountability of what you say. 
in your argument, the reasons that you give. And so I, I'm very libertarian when it comes to lifting every voice. It's very, very important. As, as much as I radically disagree with my dear brother, Clarence Thomas, he's wrong, I think, about 95% of the time. But I protect his right to be wrong because we have to have a robust conversation. And, and I would want him to protect my right. He thinks I'm wrong. I got a right. Come to Trinity and say what I got to say. People, oh, brother West, you wrong. There's two left shoes. Okay, well, tell me where I'm wrong. Rescue me where I'm wrong, as my dear brother, my lot of Karenga says. You say, rescue me if I'm wrong. I need to know. I'm listening. This I'm back again with, with Obama and Sharpton. But me and Sharpton going at it all the time. We love each other. We disagreeing. I'm hitting him hard. He hitting me hard. Then after we go off and if we don't have a drink, we have a little prayer or something. I'm a cognac drinking <laughs> Holy Ghost Baptist, you know, so I'm going to get a little cognac and hit the nightclub. But he's a minister, so it's a little bit different. <laughs> we understand that. But that's the kind of spirit we have to have at Trinity, other colleges, you have to allow people to lift their voices and they will often disagree with you. You will disagree with them. That's what it's like to be in a democratic space. Yeah. It's like. Yeah. yeah. Final question, I'll let you go. And that is, I know you don't think too much about your own legacy, but I'm just curious, what, what, what do you want uh, folks to you know, years down the road, think about your work and what you tried to do during this time in which you were here uh, on this earth? Well, that's a good question. Brother, I'm just trying to put a smile on my mama and daddy's face from the grave. Mm. That they set the standard that goes back to the best of black people. That's where I started, you see. Because the greatness of the history, the community from which I come, and that allows me to see the Samuel Beckett from the Irish part of town and all of his great. It allows me to see Chekhov and Dostoevsky and the greatness of the Russian tree. It allows me to see the greatness of other traditions of indigenous peoples and, 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 and Chicanos and so forth. But I'm grounded in my own R-O-O-T-S, my roots, so that my R-O-U-T-A-S, the routes that I take, are grounded in the smiles of those who love me hmm. so that I could not ever sell out, give up, cave in, allow despair to have the last word. No, I come from a people who always swing and don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. I'm swinging for truth, swinging for goodness, swinging for beauty you see what i mean that's that's my people yeah. that's my tradition. that's where i come from you see what i mean I and that had to do with mom and dad i didn't i didn't get that on my own i mean you didn't get that on your own you know what i mean yeah. you come from the same people man yeah absolutely well dr west we want to give you a warm virtual welcome we are excited uh to have you here and we look forward to welcoming you to campus sometime once this I, pandemic I is that person absolutely, absolutely. We'll make sure that we have that so again thank you for your your time your commitment your vision and your service uh we appreciate you thank you so much and thank you Indeed. all for joining. love you love you yeah. each one and every one of you all stay strong stay strong thank, stay steadfast thank you, thank you so much all right have a good evening everyone